Hi guys, Hi guys. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody to the post Ryoku Google Hangout with Shane Perkins, who's in Japan live at the moment. Hey Shane, can you hear us okay? Hey guys, how you going? Hey. That's great news. Yes. That's great news. Wicked. Uh, my name is Matty Roberts. I'm uh, a co producer on Ryoku. This is Josh Kaplan, the other co producer. Uh, we birthed this project with our good mate and legendary director, Davros. Um, we thought it'd be a good idea to have a hangout with Shane from his home in Takio following the broadcast on SPF2 tonight. We'll open it up to Twitter to see if there's any questions anybody had to ask Shane or us about the project. Um, so I think we might just get into it, hey, Berger? Okay? Yeah, sounds good. So, mate, you said Twitter's been cranking since, um, since people have been watching it back home. Yeah, no, thanks to everyone uh, for the feedback. It's all been really positive, so... You know, it, uh, obviously, it's nerve-wracking having a, a you know your life story out there for everyone to see. But um, no, it's fantastic. So yeah, thanks to everyone for for all the messages. Now, people don't know this at home, bro. But you actually, we sent you the the version online because obviously SPS two doesn't broadcast in Japan. And you've, yep. you've waited. You've had a few, had it for a few days, but you've waited until the time Australia is watching it to, to tune in yourself. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Obviously, um, you know, I've caught a few of the, the ones that you guys have sent through, just like, um, you know, the little previews and things like that. And I thought, um, you know, I'd send the, you know, the copies of, of the whole show that you guys did to, you know, a few friends of mine, my wife and my manager for them to have a look at. But um, I was going to sort of, uh, yeah, keep it. Till uh, the day and, and time that it was released, and kind of watch it with the, the rest of Australia. And um, yeah, look, it was uh, I was blown away. Like obviously, being part of it, you, you know, little things that are going to happen in there. But um, yeah, the job that you guys did of telling the story, I think, was uh, fantastic. Oh, mate, it's a great story to tell. And while Josh is busily there tweeting the link to the world, so the, the link has been tweeted. We're live now. Hopefully. People start sharing and come on board. We'll, we'll yeah. take questions through the Twitter hashtag, and also if you if, you, if you're on Twitter and you want to hashtag Ryoku and ask a question, we'll hear you. Uh, but also, if you're watching it on YouTube, YouTube comments. Um, oh, fantastic. Perko, um, question because we feel like we're we'll, 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 we'll have a little chat and some questions that come up today. Um, um, what was it like? <laughs> Not really being involved too much with how this project has come through uh, its profile growth in Australia. It's been announced now for the first time tonight, kind of watching your story on screen. Yeah, I guess it's, um, you know, I was a little bit nervous, obviously, in the lead up to it because, you know, some people know some of my story and, you know, some of my, my history isn't, it isn't all rosy. You know, there's been some pretty tough times, and I've uh, you know found myself in the you know the troubled areas and and stuff like that. But um, you know, I guess the positive thing out of it all is that uh, I kept pushing and uh, believed in myself, and um, you know kept going. And you know, this is where I am now. I'm, you know, world champion, been to one uh, an Olympics, and I got a great family. And um, you know, it's uh, I'm, I'm watching it now. Obviously, I, I'm happy that I, I kept pushing through. Um, you know those tough times, but yeah, watching that um, definitely, you know, uh, kind of hits the nail on the head, and you know, sends that message that uh, you never know what's gonna what's gonna happen next for you. And um, you know, I think it was uh, portray portrayed, uh, you know, really well. You keep you keep fighting no matter what. That's an awesome message, mate, and I'm glad that you saw that because we definitely, having met you and, and wanted to make this project with you and about you. That was something that was really important to us, so it's awesome that you picked it up, and hopefully a lot of other people that watched, or that are watching now, kind of realise that. The other cool thing too, I think, is, is the whole um, connection that you have really uniquely with the Japanese Kieran, because for us, we're realising in, in all the press and getting up to this, and just the curiosity of people. A lot of people don't know much about the Japanese part, the Japanese side of well, Kieran racing. They don't have the kind of um, step in it that you do. Um, and I think they've really enjoyed seeing that on there. Is there, is there some cool things that you can point out about the Japanese Kieran to people that, that makes it different to what they might have seen? In the Olympics? No? No? Yeah, look, obviously in the Olympics, um, you know, yeah, it's obviously quite quite different. You've got uh, you got the betting. Um, and things like that in Japan. I um, mean, the the biggest difference, I guess, from people watching the Olympics is that the Olympics you have all this technology and 
There's a lot written about the technology leading up to the Olympics. At the Olympics, you see all the filled-in wheels and things like that, the aero helmets, the skin suits and all that sort of thing. Well, you know, you don't see, you don't Japan, see that's all kind of... colours there. Yeah, exactly. You don't see all the, uh, you know, the nine riders with these massive as helmets on that would probably be catching 50% of the wind, you know, pulling you back. Um, yeah, and all the, the jerseys flapping around and, you know, the heavy steel bikes, um, even though... For me, it's really cool riding a steel bike. Like growing up, as I did with my dad being a, a frame builder, um, and I, I kind of missed those years of um, racing on uh, steel bikes. So, you know, it was like once you sort of got out of under 17, you were on a BT carbon bike, you know, which is, you know, we thought, oh, these are really cool. And, you know, coming to Japan, um, you know, I was quite excited to jump on a, a steel bike and, um, you know, have have a run on it, and um, you know, I guess that that's probably some of the biggest differences there. Yeah. And what, like, technically, from a weight perspective, like straight up, what what are the weight differences in both those types of bikes when you're racing internationally compared to racing in Japan? Yeah, look, in, internationally, we have uh, like a weight restriction. I think off the top of my head, it might be around six point eight kilos. I think that uh, if they're under that, you actually have to you have to hand them over and you've got to put weight on the bike so they can be, um, you know, at a, at a minimum they have to be 6.8 kilos. Um, so in Japan, you know, there's nothing carbon on the bike. So handlebars, seats, seat posts, wheels, pedals, everything's steel. Old school. Um, yeah, so obviously like with the with the steel stuff, you, they try and minimize mechanicals, um, so stuff breaking, um, which is why they, they've they've kept it that way for so long. Um, but yeah, the weight, you know, you're probably looking at, I haven't actually weighed a bike, but I reckon you'd be looking at probably close to maybe 9 or 10 kilo um, for a Kieran bike. Yeah. And what was that they like? Get, they get up there. Like, if you can remember back in like 09, I think, when it was your first time over in Japan for the Kieran. Do you remember noticing that difference? Like, had you ridden many bikes of that weight in, in, the, in the Kieran type? format prior to going over to Japan? What was the difference like? Well, the biggest difference for me, it's funny, it wasn't notably the bike, it was more the, the pedals because in international competition we have clipless pedals where you clip your foot in, clip your foot out and you have a bit of a strap on there so it holds your foot into the pedal really well. Whereas in Japan you have a, where you just kind of, you put your foot into the pedal and there's like a little slot that you, your cleat falls into so you actually have to have the straps done up to keep your foot in the pedal ah. and the setup of these pedals is is quite different to like the stack height on them and things like that is quite different to the international competition um, the equipment there so that was probably the biggest difference and then the second thing I noticed was that um, in with your international bikes you can you can put quite a bit of horsepower through them and you get you kind of get some speed back from the bike so when you really put the power down the bike responds really well. It sort of doesn't flex too much and just goes straight forward. Whereas, you know, with the steel bikes, they give a little bit. And uh, I remember the first time um, I tested out my bike, I did a, a flying sprint on a smaller gear. And uh, there was a couple of us doing, actually, Matt Crampton. Um, I can't remember who else was there, but we, oh, Ross Edgar. And uh, we, we did a, this uh, kind of flying team sprint together and we got to the first bend and all of us just about lost control of our bikes and uh, one of us ended up at the top of the track, one ended up off the track and <laughs> the pedal map not... that was in the middle of the track yeah. just because we were trying to put the power down and really pulling on the bikes that the front end just started shaking us. Um, so <laughs> from then on in, we kind of had to just squeeze the power on rather than just kicking it in the guts like we do in international comp. Sorry, mate, because I'm coming into this. You're talking about the difference between this is steel bike you're talking about compared to your, yeah, your track one. Yeah, yeah. Mate, that's that's so strange because intuitively I'd be like those those light as a feather carbon carbon bikes that you have um, would be more twitchy than the steel. Nah, look, the the, the carbon bikes are, um, are like the BT bikes, um, especially. You know we. You don't get much whip with them. I mean, uh, the first models um, that first came out, which was like many carbon bikes, um, weren't as stiff. Um, whereas now, you know, the bikes we have are very, very stiff. So, sort of everything you're putting through the pedals comes out in the speed 
you know it, it really sort of gets transferred well through the bike to the um, to the boards. Um, whereas the the Kieran bikes, uh, the steel bikes, they they've got a little bit more movement to them. Obviously, mm -hmm. with technology, the the tubing and all that sort of stuff is getting better. Like my my bike now that I race in Japan, as opposed to the bike that I first rode in two thousand and nine. Is um, you know a few steps ahead of the first bike that I had even um, just mm -hmm. with the tubing change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and mate, surely riding on on the bitumen compared to the wood wood tracks would would play a big role as well. I was just about to ask that actually. Yeah. Same planet, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it's funny. Like growing up, um, you know, dad dad will, will tell you this. I mean, he he drove me sort of almost all, all around Australia going to, to track races and most of the tracks we have in Australia are outdoors. So it, it's funny, I kind of started my career on a track that was very, very similar to a Japanese Kieran track and on a bike that was very similar. Um, yeah, right. it's well, very it's, similar so. I think we, we had that conversation when we were filming one day and it actually features in Rocco, that local track in Adelaide. Um, yeah, in Melbourne. Asphalt. Oh, it is yeah, that's the, right. the one in Melbourne, yeah. It's it's actually it's funny because there's a lot of green tracks in Japan, and the one I started, in, which was Carnegie Caulfield, um, and still there today, it uh, got resurfaced and it was green, and it was a really smooth surface, like the the surface they've got here in Japan. Um, so it's funny, you know, the start there and then eventually coming back to that over here, which is pretty cool. Mate, Green just brought up a bit of a, a side note from him. It's worth talking about because it doesn't feature heavily in the doco, although we did get a lot of footage of it and we had a conversation with none other than Mr. Nagasawa, who is, in yep. fact, as a lot of viewers might know, probably the most prominent Japanese Kieran frame builder ever of all time. Mm. Um, he's built a couple of frames for you over the last few you've been there. And it reminded me because I know that you requested a green colour. Yep. And he was telling us about how we created this green for you. So maybe give us a bit of a comment on like the whole bike building process that Nagasawa takes and how that was for you and how the green came about. Yeah, look, the um, I've had four bikes built from Nagasawa and um, I think in total I've won about I've won eleven finals in Japan with a Nagasawa frame. So I'm I'm actually yet to win a final with uh, I've changed frame builders to a diff to a Presto and I'm yet to win a final on that frame so maybe I should go back to the <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but uh, yeah look the, the last bike I got uh, last year in, in 2012 um, you know I, before that I'd had uh, white black and I think a, or two black frames and uh, you know they were fantastic bikes beautiful bikes um, really well built and I thought I oh, you know wouldn't mind something different. And uh, you know, I asked for green, and you know, I had my Olympic shorts on at the time, and I said, "Oh, yeah, wouldn't mind a green like this, and maybe a bit of yellow, like so it looks like you know the Aussie team from from the London Olympics." And he sort of looked at me, and he's like, "Oh, no, no, no!" And then he pointed at these trees, and he's like, "Like this green?" And I'm like, "Mate, there's so many different greens in there. I have no idea what what you mean." And obviously, the language barrier came in there. And he he's sort of like, "No, no, no, like this, like this." And we chatted for about ten minutes, and in the end, I just gave in and thought. Well, I guess you've built hundreds or thousands of bikes. I'm, I'm sure he knows his colours, and you know, sure enough, I put my trust in him, and it turned up at this race and unpacked the box. And I was either going to hate it or love it, and uh, sure thing, I, I absolutely loved it. And um, you I might won a couple of finals on the frame as well, so uh, it was great. It's awesome. awesome. And you might not know this, but in the interview that we had with him, that we we had transcribed for the purposes of editing this doco, he actually <laughs> talked about that green colour. Yeah. He said he had to create it um, to to hit a frame for you, and he's actually officially named it in his workshop now, Perkins Green. So there you go. Oh, That's serious? It. Yeah, we we found that out through we had the entire Japanese uh, interview transcribed. Uh, yep. So for those who don't know, we did a lot of as you were seeing the doctor, we did a lot of our interview. Um, people speaking their native tongue, so we'd ask questions in English, have them translated, and have the people speak back to us in Japanese, Dutch. Um, and Nagasawa no, couldn't speak English at all, really. So he, we didn't know till we got back to Australia the few things that he said. And one of them was about this this green that he created for you, mate. So he, he was talking about how I'm going to call it Perkins Green, and that'll be it from now on. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's awesome. Um, mate, maybe I should get a Nagasawa built then. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'll just jump in there to say to the to the viewers that are watching currently, um, if you are watching this on YouTube. Um, you might be able to leave a comment 
to the uh, right hand side of the video or even below the video as you normally would in YouTube. So if you want to give that a go, please do. Otherwise, um, you can on Twitter just using the hashtag Leoku. We've got a few viewers, but the good thing is this video will be published to to uh, YouTube and put in the Ryoku playlist. So it will be much as comes to the Anyway. Awesome, this is kind of like a reunion for us, so we're a bit excited. We haven't seen Shane since we got back um, a long time ago, and this is the first time he's seen it, and it's kind of cool to chat about it, mate. Um, what do you talk about, Shane? Is there anything there in your piece that you're like, one of the people are talking about? Or? Um, no, nah, look, I think you guys uh, kind of hit, hit the nail on the head. I mean, to be honest with you, me watching it, uh, it's kind of you know emotional. A few of the points that were brought up, and like Sean, and you know hearing Sean speak, and um, you know, and, and especially Anna as well. Most people know that we're we're good friends, and Anna's always been uh, been you know fantastic. And and my wife when they raced each other, and you know we've been friends for quite a long time. So it was great to hear from her and and what she thought about um, you know the Kierans and you know. Say that uh, you know, uh, I was one person in the team that she did look up to, and the woman that she is is uh, was awesome to hear that. Yeah, and um, to hear that she was uh, nervous about taking on on me was oh, here and you know I hadn't even got close to that at, at that point in my career when I asked him. So I thought, man, you know, mate. Um, yeah. another another really memorable quote for us, which didn't make the cut, was um, he remembered when he was. I, th I think considering either to coach you or how to coach you, he was there. One of the things he does is he looks um he looks at the athletes he's going to coach and the cyclists he's going to coach at how easy it would be to beat them. And with you, he's not easy at all. And so yeah. that was to um to take. On. Yeah, look, that was um that was pretty special to hear him say that. Obviously. Um, you know, when he whether he was going to continue um, or retire, and um, he retired not long after I, I was in Adelaide. And you know, ever since I was there, we actually got along really, really well, and we built up a friendship. Him to to coach me, um, you know, I, he was a world champion, and you know, I hadn't even I was I was having trouble believing in myself with all the things going on, and you know, uh, so it was you know really good for me to hear hear those words from him. So because obviously I look up to him as a, as a coach and. A, and a friend as well. So. Yeah, well, mate, my question for us, from us too is how did that come about? Like, you approached me on, and when you said you laughed about how he said you, you probably were too after this. Yeah, look, I, I, I was training myself, and it happened um, from sort of mid, mid to early 2007. I was training myself and um, obviously trying to make the Olympic team, and you know, I got through the World Championships in 2008. You know, I was kind of tra training. I thought to myself, "Geez, I, I was finding it hard writing my program, and then just getting like getting it done at the same time, and all that sort of thing." So I thought to myself, "You know, I need a bit of help." And um, at the time, Sean was uh, doing a bit of bit of study uh, with the coaching and degrees and stuff in order, and um, I think he was doing some coaching in New South Wales and. Thought you know why not? I'll give him a call. You know he knows a little bit about me, and I know a bit about him. We were friends, and yeah, give me give me a day or two to think about some questions, and sent me the questions through, and answered them you know straight up, and um, you know he was pretty surprised with the answers, and you know from there we we kind of we just started, and we we got after it, and um, it was kind of fun. So um, a little insight into the relationship was obviously Sean. Went to the Olympics in 2004, and um, not long before the Beijing Olympics in 2008, he had retired. So he was in the transition period um, in his life. Um, you know, he'd been in the sport for, you know, from a very young age to you know mid 30s to late 30s, and um, was transitioning from athlete to you know normal person, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was the at the crossroads as well, didn't make the Olympic team and, um, you know, funny, we were both just texting each other or on the phone the whole time the Beijing Olympics were on and 
you know, it was uh, it was quite a unique feeling, coach and athlete. Um, you know, we bonded heavily at that time, and you know, the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. Mm. And you guys, well, we know that everybody else probably does or doesn't. You guys obviously still maintain that relationship and are looking towards greater goals now, and moving moving forward into further down the track. Yeah, definitely. Look, we've got to, we've built up this huge trust um, in each other, and you know, whenever there's something that goes on, you know, I always talk about we and it's a team and um, you know, we're not just it's not an athlete, he's a, he's a very close friend of mine and, and my family you know, he, he uh, looks after our kids very often and you know, that's uh, I think that's a really special thing to have and um, you know relationships like that don't, don't come along um, for athletes um, very often so you know, normally it's, it's just this uh, athlete coach relationship and you know I've built up a, a really close bond with my coach which uh, which I'm really proud of yeah that's great mate and mate shifting focus to now like um what is it end of May so you're approaching you're approaching the hot season again over there we we as you know you I think in August or September last year um is it like winter with with um summer does it just does it just change overnight one day or is it a bit of a gradual thing what's the weather like at the moment uh, yeah, the weather in Japan at the moment is actually pretty warm in June, um, but un yeah, unfortunately, I'll be missing out on that, which will actually be kind of good because I'll get to do some training back in Adelaide, uh -huh. um, so I'll miss out on the rainy season, uh, but when I come back in July, it'll be stinking hot and actually build up a decent tan and then lose it and, uh, <laughs> a couple of days later. Uh, you know, yeah. Just because people are watching doesn't mean you need to talk about how tanned you get, mate. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 mate. I, I, mean, I, I can't get tanned at all. I'll go out in the sun, have my tan for about two days, and then... It'll... Mate, we I'm were there in me. September, and I'm telling you, you don't get tanned. You just sweat. You lose weight sweating because it's just <laughs> yeah. so humid in Japan at that time of year. So, yeah, there's no tanning going well, on. Well, stick, stick yeah. it on, stick it on focusing on your body, Perko. we got one, one question that's come through over the, over the YouTube. Yeah. Um, curious chap, named Steve. Um, is it true that professional cyclists don't wear underpants? Can you um, can you shed any light of that? Mm. Me in there. So it's like a half an underpant, I guess you'd call it. So half an underpants. Sewn in to your pants? Is that what you're talking <laughs> yeah, about? Yeah, so it's sewn into the pants. So when when we do ride our bikes, we don't wear underpants. We have uh, specifically or special made nicks. Uh, for mm -hmm. cycling that we, we pull on and they've got like kind of a padded material um, to protect your private area uh, while you're riding on the seat and make your ride a little bit more comfortable, yeah. Just like you, mate. You don't. When I walk around, I... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, another, another question, mate, a bit, on the, bit more on the, the serious. Um, yep. How do you rate your chances for the next Olympics? Yeah, look, I've been... Still uh, moving on from the last ones, but um, I, I didn't uh, win the medal that I wanted, and I won I won a medal, which I was really proud of it. Uh, I knew there was a lot to work on, and um, yeah, I, I'm doing everything I possibly can in training and and everyday life to you know make the make make Rio. I mean, it's still it's still a way off yet, but we've got uh, lots of steps. To go up uh, before we get there, but uh, yeah, look at the moment. I'm just enjoying myself. I had surgery earlier in the year to, to fix my shoulder up, and I'm recovering from that. And uh, yeah, look, I've been oh well, I'm in the best shape that I've I've ever been. So you know, having the break from my shoulder and and that's definitely done me good, and uh, and my and my mental state good as well to have that break and spend a lot of time with the family um, has been fantastic. And mate, I guess leading up to Rio, is it your, your? I know Sean mentioned um, how how cool Japan has been in. I think in the lead up to the the major cycling events, is it the same plan in the lead up to Rio? You're just gonna you're gonna use that for those um well that big occasion in three in a few years time. Yeah, look, it's, um, home, um, being in Japan and. Um, you're sort of away from that comfortable environment um, that you know I've set up in, in Adelaide. So you know, obviously 
in an Olympic year, it, it does make it difficult because we are traveling quite a bit um, as a team. Uh, and, you know, surrounding World Championships and Olympics and Commonwealth Games, you know, there is a really big team environment that's pushed uh, within the group. So, you know, it's important to be around and support each other and, um, and things like that. So, you know, I think, um, see what happens. This is my last year of my contract for this year in mm -hmm. 2013. Um, so I won't find out if I get another two-year contract until January 2014. Mm -hmm. um, so if that if that happens, um, you know I'll review it with Sean and and the, the CA uh, Gary West, um, our mm -hmm. high performance manager, and have a look at it and see if it fits into our plan um, leading up to Rio. And yeah, basically go from there. But of course we've we've done it as you and um, you know we'll. We'll go from there. I mean, we don't want to change things too much because it has worked for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So, mate, what's your schedule now? You, you're, cause the viewers might not know that you're, they do know you're still in Japan, but for how much longer? And then there's all the worlds going on, uh, sorry, trials going on shortly that you've got to attend. So you end up staying in Japan for, well, what's, what's your schedule like for the rest of the year, mate? Yeah, so at this point, uh, I've done three Kieran races. Um, in Japan, and sort of around those Kirin races, I've been through a pretty heavy training patch. Uh, obviously, after having my shoulder done, I couldn't do a lot of track work while I was in Adelaide, so we're trying to get my shoulder ready to go so when I hit Japan, I could uh, go through a pretty solid training block. Um, because this year is the first time the UCI have changed uh, the qualification rules, so in the past. You could you would earn your points through a up to make the world championships, whereas what they've done now is they've got a new rules where to make a world cup you have to get your points before the world cup. Um, so basically, what I'll be doing is I'll be going to Malaysia next week, um, next Thursday, for a couple of races in in Malaysia to pick up some qualification points, and then I'll be heading back to Adelaide to get in a, a four week uh, training block. And then doing a, a group of three races, so you've got to have a, a minimum of five races um, uh, through the through the middle of the year um, to rack up your points, and then they pick your your five best results, which would be the, from the five events, mm. and um, they you'll get get put in a ranking, and that you get to go to the World Championships. Though, so once you get to a World Cup, you have to do a minimum of two World Cups, and your points through that World Cup to be picked for the World Championships. And mate, are the points worked out per racing event or cumulatively? So the points. Uh, so each each event. Um, so say for example the sprint. Yep. Um, at the five events, I'll be riding the sprint. So you know, from first to tenth or whatever, you get points, and so they'll accumulate all those points together, and uh, that'll go to a total amount of uh, points. Okay. So Per, you have to you have to get the points per race. Your your head yeah. race events. Yeah. And for you, mate, going on is that that's the sprint um, and Kieran. Is it just those two? Yeah. I'll have um, obviously there's three events for us. So the sprint, Kieran, and team sprint. Yeah. Um, so yeah, look, I'll I'll be chasing points in in all those events. Yeah. Mate, do you reckon they'll ever, ever bring up your dad's Olympic event, the tandem? Tandem. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean, obviously they've. At that event in the Paralympics, which is awesome to watch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not too sure that, uh, that one will be brought back in anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he retired uh, from you know, international racing and um, and track racing in that uh, this year, and uh, he's been asked to ride the tandem uh, for the Paralympic team. So he's jumping on a tandem and being a pilot for them, which would be awesome to see uh, the big gorilla. Getting on a tandem and having a good old crack. <laughs> what a legend! I hope he's watching. <laughs> he's a legend, yeah, 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 he's a legend. But I think, I think the, um, I think the, it just finished playing in South, South Australia, not South Africa. Um, yep. Some good, good chatter coming through. Mate, most, most of the comments, unfortunately, aren't questions. It's all just, it's all just froth and, um, we're just, I'm just so happy with the result and, and very. Yeah, very excited about and thankful for seeing it. Mate, so your, your phone's happening. probably beeping a little bit during um, now, so we might let you get back so you can speak to your family and everything, and then we can publish this.
hang out so people can watch it during the week after they watch a few episodes. Yeah, yeah, cool. Not too easy. Now, once again, thanks for everyone for supporting the project and. Uh, you know, it's been a fantastic experience over here in Japan and um, you know, having you guys over here, you know, getting the footage and all that sort of stuff's been, been uh, you know, there's been some huge buzz in Japan. Sorry, mate. New just in. Cool. Got one more question for you from um, Yo, Brendan. 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 Brendan Barrett. Um, yeah, mate, cool. he asks, how different is the bike culture there? Um, the Kieran schools seem fairly intense. I think, he's, I think he's asking, do you have to graduate yourself from the school? Yeah, so every every year um, that we get invited, we do a two-week uh, kind of camp. Um, so we'll do a you know a series of um, assignments over there to learn the rules of racing. You know, we spend a lot of time reviewing the rules, watching races on the TV. Uh, we have exams at the end of the two weeks. Um, you know, we also get tested. Um, you know, our VO2 max, things like that, understand the rules properly, what our conditions like if we have good form, um, then bike assembly, things like that. Um, so it's mainly about understanding the rules of Kieran because it's obviously very important to understand the rules so that one, you can race to the best of your ability and also to the fact that there's betting. So we need to understand that we always my betting. Mm. Um, but yeah, for to for a Japanese writer, a person to become a Kieran writer, they have to attend school eleven months. Um, so basically, they it, it's any anyone could walk off the street and and go and attend the Kieran school. So basically, the Kieran school have to make sure that these writers know how to ride a bike for starters, and then they teach them how to train the rules of Kieran. Um, and it sort of gets more advanced as they learn more about the Kieran, but it's very, very, very strict um, for that 11 Military months. Military almost, from, from our experience. Sorry? Military almost, hey, from our experience. Yeah, it is. Uh, like the other day I was actually down the track training and they had their class for 2013 training down there. And I think there was five riders. It was a very, very windy day. And uh, they had these five riders, uh, 30 and 40K an hour, and they had to do 200 laps on a 400 meter track. So that's uh, the first I've ever seen of that. Oh. And uh, yeah, it was interesting because one of the kids, when they finished, one of the kids came off, laid down, and just started crying. <laughs> so wow. they must have had a pretty intense week by that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I suppose that helps answer Brendan's question a little bit because the culture is very different in terms of like what you know, what intense training, intense military. They're obviously committed to being in that current school for that period of time and so they're fully into it, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's a very strict environment. Obviously, the Kieran school makes sure that these riders actually really want to do the Kieran too. So part of that, the reason why it is so strict is they want to test, like in the doco it says you need mentally strong, not just strong physically, but mentally mm -hmm. tough and have that kind of samurai uh, feeling and going on about you. So, you know, that's basically what they're, they're building here is not just, um, you know, training their bodies, they're, they're training their minds to be really, really tough too so that out on the track, um, they're just leaving it all out there because it's important to sacrifice you, yourself um, in a race to win um, because there are people laying their heart down on you. All right, mate. Well, look, we'll just we'll just put a last clarification from the viewers we've got um, at the moment, and then um, if not come in, we'll we'll wrap this up. All right, yeah, cool. This has been kind of fun because um, this is the first time we've tried. Thanks, Perko, for tuning in in Japan because it's been a, a cool way to for people to see post post doco. Um, hopefully, the, the Australian public are a bit. To see what's been showing that after watching the docker, so they'll hopefully come on and have a look at this now that it'll be published on YouTube. And check it out, get a bit more of an insight. All the boys having a chat, maybe we'll do another one later on. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, just I guess just a quick a quick plug is that yeah, for anyone who didn't see the docker or would like to see it again, we're gonna be publishing one chapter a day uh, from tomorrow, uh, twelve noon. So one one chapter a day every day from twelve noon through to Friday. And that's for an international so if you're in Japan, if you're in America, Brazil, a bunch of places that are tuning in, 
um, that we can tell. So it's not geo like anyone can watch it around the world. So um, I'm sure to tune in at 12 noon Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you work back from that on your own, you can find out when you get the release. Check out this man, Shane Perkins' story. Thank you, dude, for hanging out with us. No, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for making a great story. You're Mate, welcome. Our pleasure. Absolute awesome pleasure. Awesome to tell. Yeah. Enjoy your Sunday night. What's for dinner? Have you had it yet? No. So I might uh, yeah, cook up a bit of Huon salmon. I think that'll go down a treat. <laughs> All right, as they do in traditional Japan. Yeah. Right. All right, mate. I don't know if it actually means peace. Japanese, but you know, <laughs> yes, yes, around yes. the world means please. Please. <laughs> 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 <laughs>